Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New Testament survey, BC 103. Today, we're going to study on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Before we could start, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer? Brother Subhashish, would you like to lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Let's pray. A loving Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us, Lord, from this morning also, Lord. Lord, Lord, as we are going to learn from New Testament, Lord, I pray that you bless the pastor, bless each one of us, Lord, so that, Lord, we will be able to grasp what, Lord, you want to communicate this morning. Lord, once again, I thank you for everyone, those who have not yet joined. I pray that, Lord, bless them so that they will also join quickly and we will be able to learn together as a team. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Well, we had given you all some assignment for the online, online students. Yeah. Uh, request you all to please submit your assignments on time. Even if you're delayed, there would be a certain percentage of marks been deducted. But then I would encourage you all to please submit your assignments. With that, we will start with this, uh, today's session, a to, uh, letter to the church at Thessalonica. So who was the author of this letter? Who was the author of this letter? Yes, brother. Thanks so much. Yes, yes. So it was Apostle Paul who was the author of this letter. So Paul started the church at Thessalonica when and he wrote this letter to the believers there within just few months of leaving that place so we see that in the book of acts in chapter 17 verse 2 we see luke has recorded that paul preached for three sabbath days to the jews in the local synagogue so that says about three weeks but then there are most scholars who believe that paul would have spent about three years because rather than th three uh, three years, rather than three weeks uh, with the Thessalonians, because you would have been there long enough uh, to receive uh, one or more offering from the Church of Philippians. So Paul's ministry in Thessalonica obviously touched not only Jews, but Gentiles as well. So many Gentiles in the church had come out of idolatry which was not a particular problem among the Jews of that time. So we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Can I request one of you all to read? Roslyn, if you're okay, you can, or Zeli. John Paul. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, Pastor, you're audible. Can you okay. repeat the word? Yes. Chapter 1, verse 9. First Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Amen. So we see Paul's ministry at Thessalonica has touched many souls, not only Jews, but also Gentiles. So Paul writes this first letter to the uh, church at Thessalonica saying from the city of Corinth. He writes around 51 AD, just a few months after having been preached at Thessalonica on a second missionary journey. So upon leaving Thessalonica under a threat or a pressure, Paul, Silas and Timothy traveled to Athens by the way of Berea. 
I'm just trying to summarize the whole story before we could study uh, the purpose or the very uh, features, the unique features and the other details. So, yeah. So, so when Paul, Silas and Timothy traveled to Athens by the way of Berea, so in a, after a short time in Athens, Paul felt the need to receive a report from this newborn church at Thessalonica. So he sends uh, Timothy back to serve and minister to the new believers there. So Paul wanted to check on the state of Thessalonians' faith for fear that false teachers might have infiltrated their number. So Timothy soon returned with a very good report prompting Paul to write the first Thessalonians as a letter of encouragement to the new believers. We see that in chapter 3, verse 6, saying that, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also see you. That's a wonderful report to receive from a young church. So Timothy reports include excess of sorrow over the departed saints. We see that in chapter 4, verse 13, saying that, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. We also see, um, you know, later part, chapter 2, 1, we see that some of the false accusation there and many stopped to uh, uh, stop to work talking about the eschatology that is the end times and there was a danger of immorality in chapter 4 we see that and there's a division in the church and despising of oversight so uh, this is what it states in first Thessalonians and we will also uh, 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 get to learn about Silas a new leader whom, uh, whom the disciples have selected so Silas was a leader in the early church a fellow missionary with Paul and he was a faithful brother. This is what Peter describes Silas because Silas had the opportunity to serve alongside with Paul and Peter. Uh, so uh, to look at his uh, family background, Silas, he was an Hellenist and a Jew who was also a Roman citizen. We see that in Acts chapter 16 and... Acts chapter 16 also says that he is also referred to as Sylvanus. So he, his full name was Sylvanus and maybe in short they tried calling him Silas. We see that in Paul's epistle. In chapter 1 verse 1 you see Paul, Sylvanus and Timothy. It has been addressed as Sylvanus. So Silas and Sylvanus are the same person. So we first... Uh, we met Silas in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, verse 22 to 32. Uh, we, we see that uh, he was a leader and a teacher at the Jerusalem church. And after the Jerusalem council, uh, Silas was chosen to help communicate the council's decision at the church of Antioch uh, and along with Apostle Paul. So after that, we see Paul set out on a second missionary journey and then they had a clash with Barnabas. So Barnabas takes uh, John Mark and heads a different direction. And we see Paul takes Silas and moves ahead. And later, Timothy joins uh, Paul and Silas in their second missionary journey. So what happened? On this journey, we see Paul and Silas traveled to Greece and uh, at Philippi, the missionaries were arrested, beaten and imprisoned. So Paul, Silas were in the prison. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. We see that in Acts chapter 16 verse 25. So what happened? God then miraculously released them. And the jailer, having witnessed their faith, asked them, Sir, what must I do to be saved? 
So we see that Paul and Silas answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We see that in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 to 31. So the jailer that night received Jesus as the Lord and Savior, just not him, but his whole household. He and his family were all baptized. So what happened? The fact that the prisoners were singing uh, and listening to Paul and Silas. And uh, look at the attitude of Paul and Silas. They were singing in midst of their circumstance, in midst of their trial, behind the bars, they were singing. This is not something that we should skip or take it lightly, but we need to look at the very attitude that they carried within them. And it turned out to be a blessing. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, we do have people watching us, how we react in our life's circumstance. So if Paul and Silas had been gripping or uh, protesting or whining about uh, the injustice of their situation, the jailer would have never been drawn to believe in the Lord Jesus. It's not just the jailer, but even his household. But then they responded to their situation gracefully and with joy. So their action completely changed the whole atmosphere. Why? How could they do it? Because they had the Lord Almighty within them. They had the Holy Spirit within them. They believed that they are the salt and light, as stated in Matthew chapter 5. Others had their hearts open to the gospel. And later part, we see Silas and Timothy ministering at Berea in Acts chapter 17. We see Silas spent extra time in Corinth. Look at the heart of uh, walking more than a mile. Being there for the believers, equipping them, ministering to them, despite the time and season. Silas spent extra time in Corinth ministering after Paul left that city. So Silas served with Peter as well. We see that when we read the book of Peter. In fact, he is thought to have delivered the epistle of 1 Peter to his recipients. So what we see here when we look at uh, Silas, his lifestyle, yes, we always uh, get to read or hear more about Paul and Peter. But there were other disciples also who served alongside with Paul and Peter. Like Stephen, a man who was full of spirit. And he was the first martyr. And now we get to study about Silas. Very soon when we study on First Timothy, then I will share about Timothy. These are the people who had a good character, who have developed a good character, who, uh, you know, who served faithfully. And they stand out to be a great example for each of us. They use their gifts to serve the Lord and others with all their heart, willingly. So we see that in the letter, Apostle Paul called Silas as faithful. And he was known as one who encouraged and strengthened the brothers in the church. He had the gift of encouragement. No matter how small or how big the gift that God has put in each one of us, are we willing to serve the Lord in the area that God has called us? Among the people whom, whom God has assigned us to. So there were multitudes in the early church. And they all were blessed by the ministry of Silas and Paul and Peter and the other disciples. And Silas was an inspiration that we can draw from this letter, how we can serve people in the church with all that we have. With that, I will move on 
with the background, few more background details about first and second Thessalonians. I've, I've just combined both the letters together. So in Paul's second missionary journey, Paul and Silas had received a call from Macedonia to preach the gospel at Macedonia. So they immediately responded and went to Philippi, where they were beaten and put in the prison, as we saw in the summary. So shortly after their release from the prison, they decided to leave that place um, under pressure of the young church. So after that, they uh, after leaving Philippi, they came to Thessalonica. We see that in Acts chapter 17, 1 to 10. So Paul followed his normal custom, whichever place he went, he first went to the synagogue of the Jews. And we see that there was an open door in the synagogue for about three weeks. And as some scholar believes that Paul could have, uh, would have stayed there for more than three weeks, about three years, we are not sure about it. So Paul had this uh, usual twofold reaction in that quite a number of people were persuaded and believed. But those who were not persuaded and did not believe stirred up a riot against Paul. So the mob that had been created came against the household of Jason, where it was believed that the Christians were meeting and brought Jason before the magistrate with false charges. So because of the pressure of the situation, Paul and Silas were smuggled out of the town by night and went to Berea where they continued to minister. So what we see here, if from one place you face an opposition, let not the gospel stop there. Move out. Look out for a new place to share the word. We have people everywhere and, you know, the gospel... The good news need to reach, need to be reached. So we need to take that bold stand. Nothing should stop the word of God. So eventually, the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica came to Berea, learning that Paul and Silas are there. And what did they do? They stirred up the crowd against Paul and Silas there. Again, from Berea, Paul was forced to leave. And now, Silas has joined. So what happened? Paul says, sorry, uh, Timothy has joined Paul. So Paul tells Silas and Timothy, you all stay here and build the church. I will move out of Berea. So, what, uh, so Paul moves to Athens where he ministered in the marketplace while he visited Paul and Silas to rejoin him there. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, we see that Timothy evidently joined Paul at Athens long enough after Paul to send back the Thessalonica to help ground this new work. So Paul did not stay at Athens for long. He eventually went on to Corinth where he started a business and partnered with Aquila and preached in the synagogue. We see that in Acts chapter 18. So Silas and Timothy eventually rejoined Paul again at Corinth. Timothy gave Paul a good report of what was happening in the church at Thessalonica, even though they were facing quite a bit of persecution for their faith. Then we see uh, the follow-up to the church at Thessalonica. Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to help establish and strengthen the work. Can I request one of us to turn to chapter 3, verse 1 to 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Anita, would you like to read? Leah Lama, Aradhana, anyone in the class? Okay, 
let me read. Yes, please. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. Amen. Is it chapter 3, verse 1 to 5? 1 to 3, I actually have read. Okay, 1 to 3, you read. Yes, I pointed to this. 4 to 5, please. Yeah. 4 and 5. In, in fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that that way, as you will know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the temper had, tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Amen. Thank you, brother. So what we see here, Paul sent Timothy back to the Thessalonian, Thessalonica to establish and strengthen the work. Why? Because of the problem that they may face and to strengthen their face, to encourage them and to establish them in the word. We also see when Timothy returned and gave this report to Paul, Paul wrote to follow up on the report. The report had two emphases that Paul addressed. First one, he commended them for their faith in the face of adversity. And the second one, we see that Paul corrected some problems that were prevalent in the church. With that, we also see Paul wrote, second letter to the church just a couple of months after the first letter he writes uh, like paul may have looked in on the church briefly at the end of his third missionary journey when he circulated among the churches of greece so what was the purpose of this letter i'm sure each of you all would have gone through the notes but I've gone through the purpose, the features, the unique features, the theme, the key verse, isn't it? So can one of you all please look into your notes and tell me what was the purpose of this letter? So we see that Paul had received a report from Timothy regarding the condition of the church, which was very evident. And yes, there was po a positive that report and also it also had a negative aspect. So on the positive side, the believers in the church at Thessalonica had been very faithful under the pressure of the persecution. So that was the positive side. And let's look at the negative side. The negative side was um, there was few problems that Paul felt the need to be addressed. He did not ignore the problems. He addressed them immediately. So what did he do? Paul felt the need to defend some of his actions, like how he con conducted himself among them. In chapter 2, verse 1 to 16, we see that. Why he was not with them and why he sent Timothy. Because the the Jews who were against Paul came up with their own stories and they started, um, you know, causing problem to Paul. So he is trying to defend the believers in the church by giving them the reason, the right reason. So Paul felt the need to admonish them regarding the areas of their Christian behavior at the same time. So what was it? There were three areas that he addresses. That is sexual purity. In chapter 4, we see that chapter 4 and also in chapter 5. talks about the brother, brotherly love, treatment of the church le leaders. We also see Paul felt the need to correct them in doctrinal areas relating to afterlife and the second coming of Christ. So Timothy most likely delivered this letter to the church. So 
with that, we will look into the theme of this book. What was the theme? The central theme of both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is the second coming of Christ. So in every chapter in this book contains at least one reference to this subject. The word coming, which is in Greek means parousia, occurs seven times. So Paul was counteracting with some false concepts that people had regarding the second coming. There were those who were suggesting that Christians who died in faith would not have the same glorious experience of Christ's return. So uh, they, they, they would miss out. We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So Paul let the people know that the second coming will not be quite an event. But those who die in faith would not miss out. He also, he also uh, explains it to them saying, Christ will return with a loud shout. An archangel will make a similar commotion with a loud trumpet sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who believe, who are alive on earth, will ascend with them to meet the Lord in the air. And we will live together with the Lord forever. We see that in chapter 4, um, verse 13 to 17. Yes. And we also see that there were those who were suggesting that since Christ's return was imminent, there was no need to stay engaged in work. So Paul, you know, he voices out for that. The challenges that will happen. Till Jesus comes, continue to do what you're doing and not to stop your work. We also see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. So he's encouraging to focus on the relationships of the second coming of Christ in relation to the believers. So this book sees the comfort side of the second coming. And, in this, and also the second Thessalonians focuses on the relationship of the second coming of Jesus in relation to the unbelievers. So this book sees the judgment side of the second coming. Um, we see that in second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 to 10. Can I request one of you all to read? Can we read? Yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 to 10. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Thank you. Thank you, John. So what we see here, we're focusing on the relationship of the second coming of Christ in relationship to the unbelievers. So this letter focuses more on the judgment side of the second coming of Christ. So what are the other themes that we see in this book? The three key words of the biblical Christian experience. We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. We see that we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love and patience. Your work of faith, labor of love and patience. So what we see, faith, hope and love. 
So these are the key words we see in First and Second Thessalonians. So faith occurs about 13 times in this letter, in both First and Second Thessalonians. And hope occurs five times and love occurs eight times. Paul commends the believers at Thessalonica for three things. First is their work of faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 to 9, it talks about the work of faith seen in these believers was their turning from the idols, their turning to God in the face of persecution and their joy in the Holy Spirit. And the second one, we see that the labor of love, the labor of love seen in these believers was the willingness to serve the living God and all that it means. And the third point we see that is their patience of hope. This is the area that Paul sought to strengthen each one of us. Their hope was to wait for Christ's return and the prospect of deliverance from wrath to come. So these words were seen in relation to each other in the New Testament. Uh, faith was, uh, we, we, we see that the key chapters, uh, key chapters about faith, hope and love with the other scriptures as well. For example, we see about faith in Hebrews 11, where the chapter talks about the heroes of faith. And in Romans chapter 8, we see the hope, the patience of hope. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see where Paul talks about the labor of love. And also we see Paul uh, talks about the same thing, a labor of love in Galatians chapter 5, verse 5 to 16. So most of his letters addresses certain issues. And he talks about, he encourages the believers in faith, hope and love. So the emphasis on the, we also emphasize, in this letter, we see the emphasis on the deity and exaltation of Lord Jesus Christ. So in Acts chapter 17, verse 2 to 3, can we turn to Acts? Let, book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 2 to 3. Acts 17 verse 2, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and to rise again from death, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Thank you. Thank you, John. So what we see here, the emphasis on the deity of Lord Jesus Christ. He exalts his name. Note, the, the name of Jesus occurs 54 times in these eight chapters. In First and Thess Second Thessalonians, he, he, mentioned it, he has mentioned it as Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ and Jesus. So he is exalting the name of Jesus and is giving him all reverence. And what are some of the unique features of this book? Paul gives us a good look at the spirit of truth and false ministry in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He addresses some issues like the qualities of the false ministry, the error, unclean, deceitful, man-pleasing, flattery, covetousness, seeking praise of men and demanding. And he tries to address all these areas with how. If there's an error, the true ministry is about gentleness. If there's unclean, the true ministry is about loving. If we face deceitful, the true, mean, uh, true ministry is selfless. If we are man-pleasing, now, we, the ministry is all about hard working. We need to be devoted. We need to be blameless. We need to be just friend of God. So these are certain things that Paul addresses in this letter. Paul also goes, goes ahead and teaches uh, this church how to face adversity. 
maintain uh, 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 how to face adversity in different areas and he encourages the church believers or the uh, believers and the saints in that church to maintain be an example in affliction and your testimony is stronger because of what you are going through and he also encourages them by saying maintain your boldness and do not fear what men can do to you maintain your faith knowing that affliction is part of your destiny as believers and as he encourages the church even we today go through similar kind of situation in our life in our church in our ministry and here this letter is encouraging us be an example be bold do not fear have faith in jesus and god will take care of those who trouble you take it to god in prayer and also be encouraged that endure it being focused on jesus return on christ return you will find rest and in the letter of second thessalonians he introduces us to the antichrist we see that he is seen as the man of sin the son of prediction and lawlessness one he will perform lying signs and wonders and he will deceive many who will worship him as god and he will be destroyed at the second coming of christ not long enough you will see the destruction on him when the second coming of christ is we see that in the second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 verse 8 he says that and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming amen so endure things till the coming of the lord so what did we learn from these two letters what did we learn from these two letters anyone in the class what was our learning from these two letters what was the learning yes our learning is to be encouraged during trial yes brother lubega please go ahead i think one of the learning the learning we get from first and second thessalonians is to wait for jesus christ patiently patiently doing the right thing as we wait for him thank you pastor thank you thank you lubega yes we need to be encouraged to be strong in faith Yes we need to wait for the second coming of Christ with an expectant heart keep yourself prepared live your life every day remembering that Christ return is at hand so our anticipation of Christ return should not keep us from living lives in a responsible manner so if we don't understand scripture correctly it will affect how we live our lives so i will leave you with two reflection questions can we examine ourselves and ask is our hope in christ written changing the way we live our life i repeat can we examine ourselves and ask that is our hope in christ written changing the way we live our life and the second question are we disciplined and self control is it evident in our life that may be contagious for others to follow our lifestyle as paul states be an imitator of me as i imitate christ the best example Uh, the best way uh, to share the good news with others is when we live our life in that way can we take this time as we study this letter of first and second thessalonians to examine ourselves 
are we living our life in worthy of Christ coming? Yes, it is not easy. There would be challenges. But then his strength is much greater in us. When we look at him, we can draw his strength and try to change our life. It is a process. I'm not saying we should be perfect. Yes, it is a process. Sometimes we fall. As believers, we fall. But then we have a God who uplifts us. He encourages us. He allows us not to give up, but then move ahead because He is a faithful God. He is holding us, not we, to, be, to give up that easily. But then when we hold on to Him, we will draw the strength and we will overcome our temptation. We will overcome our challenges in life and move ahead with the hope, with the anticipation of Christ's return is at hand. With that, we will conclude this letter. And I request one of us from a class, if you'll have any questions or anything that you would like to share, please feel free. If not, we can request one of you all from our class to end this session with a word of prayer. Do you all have questions or is there anything that you would like to share? about these two letters, please feel free. Okay. Can we conclude with a word of prayer? Zeli, can I request you to pray? Is there some problem with the mic? I'll pray, Pastor. Yes, yes, John. Please go ahead. Father, we want to thank you for this time of learning. Well, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Oh God, we pray as we continue to um, live our life in this world. Lord, we pray that we would have uh, an attitude of submission towards you as we uh, wait upon your second coming and we pray Lord that we would uh, have that hope inside our hearts that we would be able to reveal uh, the the extensive hope to people around us those who are in hopeless situation oh God we pray that we would watch ourselves and guard ourselves um, as we prepare this uh, coming days Lord Jesus we thank you for Pastor Diana enabling her to share your word, and we pray, O oh God, that we would be able to reflect uh, your goodness in the days to come, O oh God. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John, for, uh, for praying. Thank you. Let's see in tomorrow's class. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.